Blessed are you because you have believed yet have not seen. Yes, with the eyes of faith, you know the grace and the mercy and the peace of your God demonstrated on the cross of Christ. Blessings to you each and every day as you marvel at that glory of God's Son. This morning I want to focus on that gospel lesson as uh, we prepare our hearts uh, for the Lenten season, which begins on Wednesday. Uh, Let us begin with a prayer. Lord, bless our hearts as you fill us with the peace of forgiveness And you fill us with strength that we might live as your people, going about our lives serving you and proclaiming your love to the world. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. I don't know if you've had one of these experiences before, but last weekend when we showed up at our cabin, I took a moment, I kind of closed my eyes, and I thought to myself, "Ah, it's good to be here. I had my doubts because it was an eight-hour ride just to get there. And when I heard about the Creation Museum, I remember years ago, I don't know if I was all that excited to make such a trip to go see the museum. Noah's Ark, eh, how could it be that big of a deal, right? Uh, So I suppose knowing that I was going to be with friends kind of kept me going. But as we know from certain times when uh, we're not quite sure how things are going to turn out, Once we got there in the quietness of the woods uh, and the the bright stars in the sky because there were no city lights to kind of drown them out, uh, it was good to be there, right? To to relax for a couple days, to sort of refresh the batteries. Made me think about the Epiphany season because maybe that's one of the reasons that we have the Epiphany season. It's it's to kind of go back to those glorious stories of God's Son, Jesus, and how he demonstrated to people that, yes, he is the Son of God. And so the last couple of weeks, we've looked at miracles. We've listened to powerful sermons of Jesus, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We've seen glimpses of his glory. But none have been as powerful and as mesmerizing as what we just witnessed a few minutes ago. All Peter could say, Lord... I'm glad it's good for us to be here. He just wanted to soak it in and take it with him. If that's true, if it's good for us to be here, then how can it be such a struggle on a Sunday morning to get here? Right? As we rub our eyes as we're still walking through the door. If we're Christians, how is it then that we can have so many gloomy days when when, when we seen the glory of Jesus, and, and we know that just a little bit of that glory goes a really long ways each and every day throughout the week. Why don't we always react the way Peter did? Right? Uh, when we have ample opportunities to see Jesus for ourselves in the scriptures. I, I suppose the reaction that the disciples had, what they went through on the Mount of Transfiguration, sort of summarizes the very ups and downs you and I have each and every day, each and every week. One moment, they're like this little kid in the candy shop, just this giddy smile on their face. They can't believe what they've seen. They've never seen that before, this light radiating from Jesus and his clothes. And and it wasn't the sun or it wasn't the moon reflecting off Jesus' face. And then the the fogginess of that cloud that enveloped them, it, it almost served as a way to intensify how bright this glory of Jesus was. But in but in an instant, the moment that the Heavenly Father spoke everything changed. They dropped to the ground. They were terrified, we're told. They they were petrified. They were scared to death. God's voice alone had struck them with the fear of God. Had had God been reading their doubt-filled, sinful thoughts? Had he been eavesdropping on their quarrel, their selfish quarrel on the road when they were fighting about who was the best and who was good enough to serve on Jesus' right and left when he restored his kingdom? And just a few days earlier from this event today that we're looking at, 
Peter had made that very bold confession. Jesus, you are the son of the living God. Well, then Jesus began to explain to him what it meant to be the Christ, that he'd have to suffer and die on a cross to save them. And Peter, just like that, he almost takes Jesus and rips him up one side and down the other. Right in front of all of his peers, he sort of scolds Jesus, appalled at what Jesus said. He says, never, Lord, I will never let that happen. And then they hear the voice of God. Was God coming to set the matter straight with them? Would he be merciful and patient with them as he got closer to them? Them, They and their their shallow faith and their, their sinful pride. Things were going so well that day. And all of a sudden, with the snap of the fingers, they were experiencing this horrifying ordeal. God. Well, when you think about it, isn't that what God intends for us to feel and experience when we read his law in the Bible? Isn't a confession of sin supposed to be a horrifying ordeal? We kind of sang about it in the opening liturgy, hasten to save me, O Lord, but we were still standing. I don't know if you had your heads down or not. But each one of our sins deserves a punishment much worse than what we know of crucifixion. None of us really is worthy to stand in God's presence, to stand in his house. Because we all know that we're sinful, right? The the clothes that we wear are, are never worthy. They're stained with sin. Think of Ash Wednesday. There's a reason we call it Ash Wednesday. It's to remind us that dust we are, and to dust, ashes, we shall return. Those are powerful words because those ashes mean death, and, and that's the consequence. That, that uh, is the conviction that we're sinful. Every once in a while, and maybe in Bible class, we talk about, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could just hear God speak to us? Just know that he really is there, just so he could talk to us directly and just kind of tell us, this is what I want you to do, and and this is what's going to happen. Well, maybe after we read the stories of the Bible, maybe we would sort of change our minds. There's always a little of that curiosity of what that voice actually sounded like, but that's assuming He has nice things to say to us. The Bible tells us that no one can survive the visible presence of God, but we can even barely survive the voice of God. I can sort of picture the disciples on the ground and and their hands are kind of cowering over their heads, just scared to death what maybe God should have done to them just because of the last few minutes of sin that they had committed. Yeah, God was hoping that they would admit and sort of be humble in that way, but throughout the story, we see God demonstrating his divine love for them. Peter has a way of always saying things, maybe without thinking about them. Um, Peter maybe didn't quite get the whole situation on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. He thought... Uh, let's just build a place right here and we can all stay together and enjoy this moment for the rest of our lives. But God knew that Jesus had a bigger plan. He couldn't stay there on the mountain. So then God speaks to his children uh, to encourage them and to assure them of who Jesus is, but also to remind them there's more to this than just being on the mountain and enjoying this glorious experience. He commands them, you need to listen to Jesus Listen to what he's told you about what's going to happen because that's what's most important. And we already heard the impact that it had on Peter's life and his ministry. We heard earlier in the the second lesson, Peter confessed, we were eyewitnesses of his majestic glory. Well, the icing on the cake that day was Jesus coming over to the disciples 
and reaching out and actually touching them. And when you really think about this is the Son of God in human form, willing to come and touch human beings. It's almost as if his flesh and bones were sort of shielding the disciples from his almighty power. But in such a gentle touch, uh, spoke volumes, such a gentle touch spoke volumes of his love as he used human touch to comfort. It's the same thing that he does for you and me as we partake of the Lord's Supper. In bread and wine, he touches our hearts and he satisfies our hunger. Get up, go in peace. Don't be afraid anymore. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. It was that work that Jesus was getting ready for on the Mount of Transfiguration. His heavenly father was giving him that that last oomph and that last ounce of energy that he would need to carry out that plan of loving us and forgiving us. Moses and Elijah the the prophets who had always spoken about that sacrifice of the perfect lamb, they were there that day to encourage Jesus and and to give him sort of that pep speech. And so it was important, it was good for Jesus to be there. With those words of encouragement from the prophets, I can almost picture tears maybe coming down his cheeks as he thinks about all the people he was going to get to save. It was there on the mountain that maybe we could say Jesus got a taste of home. Uh, And maybe we could see the tears of joy as he's thinking, I'm almost home. And once he's home, he knows he's going to start preparing a place for all of his people. And just the excitement, right, as he left that mountain. As difficult and hard as it was going to be, the end goal, that love of Jesus was going to go a long ways in saving people. For Peter, James, and John, for years to come, they would remember all that happened that day. How incredibly uh, comforting and encouraging images those images must have been for them, especially when they're sort of knee-deep in the muck of their own sin, or or when they're being ridiculed and mocked because they preach about Jesus. How rewarding for them that they could share this story over and over again with fellow sinners and give them the same joy and peace that they had. How powerful for Peter, James, and John. The day that they took their last breath, they had a very powerful picture of what the life to come was going to be like. We haven't literally seen Jesus with our eyes, but we have experienced uh, such a, a glorious experience through the eyes of faith. But we've seen a little bit of Jesus and his love for us. And how important, right, when we look in the mirror and see ourselves. Or when we look ahead to this week and realize the things that we're going to have to deal with. Just a little bit of Jesus goes a long ways. So then I guess the question is, why don't we make more use of a little bit of Jesus more often throughout each and every day? Why wouldn't we share that, those glimpses of Jesus' glory with our friends who are going through the same things that we are? It was clear the disciples weren't ready yet to go out and tell everyone what they saw on the mountain. Jesus says, just wait, wait till I rise from the dead, then you'll really understand what this was all about. And so they need to be trained, little by little, getting more bits and pieces of Jesus, and the picture and the puzzle would become more clear to them. Like the disciples, uh, you and I need little bits of Jesus day in and day out to take it in and sort of meditate on. Because the more we do that, the brighter the glory of our Savior Jesus' love for us, but also the more powerful our witness as certainty fills our hearts and as joy fills our hearts of what is yet to come. That, that little bit of Jesus goes a long ways, right? Especially as we think about that one day when we will stand in God's presence 
that one day when we will see him in all of his glory. Like the disciples, we can only handle so much of Jesus. It takes our minds and our hearts to sort of comprehend what he's all about. And so bits and pieces, little by little, we learn more about his love for us and we take that in and we meditate on it. So we can agree, it's good for us to be here, especially on a Sunday morning, especially if we can enjoy a sunny Sunday morning. But each and every day as we are near Jesus in his word, it's a blessing because a little bit of Jesus goes a long ways each and every day as we strive to serve our God out of thankfulness and joy. May you take advantage of many opportunities to see those glimpses of Jesus' glory that sort of whet your appetite for that glory that you will see in heaven. God grant you that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close out our, our meditation devotion this morning as uh, we'll turn to hymn, 100, uh, hymn 95, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 5 of How Good Lord to Be Here. At this time, we uh, gather our thank offerings to our Savior, Jesus. You're invited to fill out one of the white connection cards that you find in the pew.